Hi, everybody. Uh, this is John Porcellino. Uh, you guys read my book, The Hospital Suite, for your class. And uh, I'm uh, going to be answering these questions that you have for me. Uh, <clears throat> I went through them a little bit ahead of time just to get a sense of what you guys asked, but I didn't um, spend too much time with it so that my answers could be a little bit more spontaneous as well. So I'm going to read uh, the, your names and your uh, questions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll answer them. Uh, this is from Dom. What inspired you to write the hospital suite? Also, percentage-wise, how much of the graphic novel was fiction or nonfiction? Um, what inspired me to write the, the book was, uh, the, I mean, the, First of all, I'm an autobiographical cartoonist, so um, everything that happens in my life, I, I consider a possible subject of my work. Um, in, the, in the case of the stuff that's in the hospital suite, I um, during the time that I was going through this stuff, it was very difficult for me to write about. It was difficult for a number of reasons, um, one of which was that as a storyteller, I didn't really know what exactly was happening to me and and what um, wh how this was going to end, how it was going to turn out. So I, 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 there was no like arc to the story that um, I had at my disposal as a writer. Um, Consequently, I, when I did write about it in my work, it was generally in the form of very short, uh, somewhat poetic, um, kind of obtuse uh, stories. Hang on, my cat's trying to jump on my lap. Uh, obtuse kind of stories where I, 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 I kind of skirted around the subject. I talked about feelings or I talked about uh, things in very... Uh, general, very vague ways, but I didn't really ever openly address the health issues, both physical health and mental health issues that I was going through. <clears throat> um, so, um, you know, oh, hang on. this is a big boy. Say hi, baby. Um, if you've just read the hospital suite, you should know that the primary form that my work takes is a is a photocopied zine, which I said you have one of them there, um, called King Cat Comics, and it's just a little 32 page photocopied black and white pamphlet that I've been self publishing since 1989. And all my other books, uh, aside from the hospital suite um, of my own personal work, have taken the form of collections that collect the work that originally appeared in King Cat Comics. So when I was going through this experience, I, I, um, when I did write about it in King Cat, it was in the form of very short, maybe one or two pages, very oblique um, descriptions of what was going on, but I never really came out and described in any kind of straightforward detail what was happening. Um, what changed was that um, I, I published a book called Map My Heart that collected all those stories. They, they were the stories that were um, I had written during the time period that then I depicted in the hospital suite. And um, in the back of the book, I usually put little notes that kind of give the reader a little bit of extra information or whatever about uh, the, a particular story. And um, I realized in writing the notes that I, I had to somehow address the fact that I was going through these serious health issues uh, that I had to terribly crippling OCD and stuff during the time I was working in comics. So I, I, I wrote about that a little bit in the back of the book. And then when I went on the book tour for Map in My Heart, uh, I felt, you know, there's really, there's no way to talk about this stuff without, you know, the work itself can stand on its own. But if you're going to, if I'm going to stand up here and talk about the work, I'm going to have to. Um, address these underlying issues that I was experiencing at the time. And um, so I started talking about it. And what I found was the, the more that I talked openly, especially about the OCD, 
Uh, the OC, you know, mental health is a, is a problem in our society that is swept under the rug a lot. And there's a lot of shame involved for people who have these kind of problems. Um, people don't like to talk about it. Um, they feel afraid of being honest about it. Um, and I certainly felt that way as well. And, um, you know, a large part of the fact that I could only write very obliquely about my experience was because I was ashamed of uh, my mental health issues. Um, you know, one of the tough things I always say about OCD is that even though you're crazy, you're not actually like completely crazy. Like the whole time uh, you're washing your hand for the hundredth time in the day, you're very well aware that you don't have to wash your hands a hundred times a day, that this is like, this is uh, not normal behavior and it's probably not rational behavior. And you feel compelled to do these things, even though a huge part of your mind is telling you, just cut it out. You know, you don't have to do this stuff. And so it creates this, this incredible tension within a person. And it was very hard for me to write about that for that reason as well. So I started talking about it when I was doing the, the book tour for Map of My Heart, when I would address audiences about the work. And... Um, invariably afterwards somebody somebody in the audience no matter where it was would come up to me and thank me for speaking so openly about mental health issues and um they would relay that either they had ocd or someone that they in their family had ocd or you know their significant other had ocd and <clears throat> i i realized what a widespread problem mental health mental illness is and also what a widespread problem is uh, in the fact that people don't feel like they can speak openly about it and so during that time i i kind of made it my mission to uh to be as brutally honest as i could be about my experiences in an open-hearted and empathetic way and to accept and listen to the stories that other people would would give me in return and um, what I found was the, the more that I spoke openly about um, my, my anxiety, my depression, um, the less of a grip it, it held over me. Um, in, in a way, it was very healing for me to be able to finally open my mouth and, and let this stuff out that I tried to keep hidden for basically a decade at that point. So, um, I forget what your original question was, but um, that was kind of my inspiration to the hospital suite. So I had this book, Map of My Heart, that talked about this period in my life, like I said, in these kind of short, uh, poetic, um, obscure kind of comics. And what I wanted to do was write, uh, write these experiences down in a way that was the opposite. It was just very straightforward, um, uh, opened up everything that I kept hidden before. And, uh, you know, I'm an artist, so I probably default to a little bit of poetic language now and now and then, but I did want to just make the hospital suite as direct and straightforward in an account of my experiences during that time period, um, to serve as kind of, a counterbalance to the to the quieter vague uh, um, purposely unclear stories that I had done about it in the past oops okay so I guess oops I, I stopped it I should have paused it so I'll have to string those together um, the next question is from Anna. Do you find that graphic novels allow you to tell stories differently than normal novels? How do you decide what part of the hospital suite to tell through the art versus what to tell through writing? This is a question that people ask cartoonists a lot. Um, uh, there's, I wish there was a good answer for you. Um, there, you know, I, I've never written a, a normal novel. I've never written just a text novel, a prose novel. Uh, so I don't know how it compares making a graphic novel to a regular novel. Um, you know, 
uh, this is a question that, like I said, cartoons get asked a lot. They're like, well, you draw cartoons. Do you want to make this into like an animation? Or why did you make it a comic instead of a regular book that's all text? And the only good answer I can give in my own personal experience is just that I am a cartoonist. I mean, I'm a, I'm a writer and I draw, but uh, the primary form that my art takes is through comics, which is a kind of hard to describe amalgamation of of writing of text and image um you know there's occasions in especially you know in in uh king cat my zine there oftentimes are pieces that are just pure text little essays or poetry or things like that um but uh Primarily, I, I, I just, I've been doing, drawing comics for, I'm 51 years old. I've been drawing comics probably since I was 10 years old. And so it's just kind of the way I think about uh, the world. It's the way that I've learned to express myself. Um, so as for how did you decide what part to tell through art versus what to tell through writing, that's a trick that every cartoonist has to figure out for themselves. Everybody has a different approach to it, and uh, that's what creates the wildly divergent styles, not just in the art, but, you know, the different styles that uh, in storytelling approaches that different cartoonists will take. So, um, you know, I, even though this is probably an unsatisfying answer, at this point, I don't really think about it too much. It's just kind of what comes natural to me. So there's certain parts of a story where uh, maybe I rely more on imagery, and then there's certain parts of the story where maybe the text will get a little bit more dense or there'll be more like conversation and uh, word balloons going back and forth between characters and things like that. Uh, but it's, uh, to be honest, it's not something that I think about that much at this point. It's just something that um, I kind of see the work in my head and I try to put it down in on paper in a way that is true to the way that I see it in my head. Okay, next question is from Cody. What would be one thing we are missing not having this as a live discussion in a classroom setting? And do you see a benefit in this Q&A that we have not would have not gotten in a, in a live discussion? Um, well, you wouldn't be able to see how well organized my office is if we were doing this in your classroom because the classroom would be tidy. Um, even though it looks like a total chaos behind me, I actually am one of those people that um, I know where everything is <laughs> behind me, which stack and which pile a certain book is in. Or um, uh, I run a I run a small press distribution company for for comics. And um, so a lot of what you see behind me is like packing materials and things like that, envelopes, um, boxes, backing boards, things like that. Um, now, you know, one thing I will say is that I, I, I've had OCD for a long time. Uh, it's much, much better now than it was during the time period in the hospital suite. It's, it's, it's night and day difference, but I still have a little bit of OCD and um, I probably always will. It's just a matter of how well you're, you're able to manage it in any given time. Um, many of the people that I've cohabited, cohabited, cohabitated, cohabited with, lived with, have said to me, <laughs> why can't you be the kind of person, the kind of person who has OCD where you have to like pick up every little speck of dust off the floor and keep the counters all tidy because I'm not a very tidy person. Um, I, I've tried very hard. In my mind, I can imagine what it's like to be a tidy, organized person, but uh, I, I'm not so much. So you wouldn't you wouldn't get to get this uh, glimpse into the background of my life here if, if we were doing this in your classroom. Okay, this question is from Megan. What was your opinion on your healthcare providers during your stay at the hospital and during other visits? On page 102, you mentioned how your illness has given all these people a chance to practice compassion. In your opinion, do you think that both Dr. Weber and Dr. Braun valued compassion while treating patients? Well, this is a tricky question. Um, I mean, the healthcare system saved my life. Um, and if you look 
you know, in the, the stories that are in, in the hospital suite, um, there's some stories in which um, the medical system was able to approach my problems um, with a certain expertise and uh, take care of things. And, you know, I, I had I had a life-saving surgery, an abdominal surgery, and the surgeon who did it did a fantastic job. Um, I wouldn't be here without that expertise. On the other hand, there's clearly parts of the story once you start getting into certain aspects of illness that are not so clear cut where Western medicine uh, it has a tendency to fall short sometimes. Um, you know, even in the case of my uh, the tumor that led to my surgery, I was misdiagnosed at first. Um, I don't remember if this is in the book or not, but when I had a follow-up visit several months later with the doctor, uh, he told me, you know, this is, you're, you're going to be, your case is going to be used in medical school going forward uh, because it's a, it's a example of how we really got it wrong at first. You know, we, we, we missed a lot of stuff. We, we used every test that we had at our disposal to find the tumor and we failed to find it. Um, so I'm glad to be that of service to, to the medical world of medical knowledge. But, you know, in general, I mean, these people were, are doing their jobs because they're, they want to help people. Um, the, the amount of stress and difficulty that they must face every day I mean, we're looking right now, right? We're in the middle of this pandemic where I'm talking to you long distance. Um, and yet the, the, these medical care, medical people are out on the front lines, um, risking their health every day to help others. And so um, when I say that it, my illness gave these people a chance to practice compassion, it was an insight that I had during that experience into how interconnected we all are, and that, um, you know, my my own life plays sometimes a small but maybe significant part in other people's lives, and vice versa. You know, these people who were attending to me while I was ill um, were doing me a tremendous service. And at the same time, maybe me being there, um, it gave them the chance to practice their own empathy, to practice their own compassion. And, uh, you know, so it was very moving. It was a very moving experience. The next question is from Stephen. How many tries did it take to make the hospital suite? Uh, how many times did you start over, give up for a little bit, redo panels, etc.? There were places in the book where the anxiety made cartooning really, really difficult. So I was wondering if you could elaborate with making the hospital suite too. So with the hospital suite, um, while I was in like the emergency room, I wasn't taking notes, and I really had no idea what was going to happen. There were there were obviously several times where I wasn't sure if I was going to make it through the other side of whatever I was facing. But um, about the, by the time that I um, was released, maybe the first time when I was misdiagnosed with Crohn's, um, and certainly after my surgery, which took place, I think, like three weeks or a month later, um, I immediately began writing copious notes about what had just happened to me. And I, I had a calendar, so I wrote down, you know, this was the date that I had the barium x-ray. This was the date that I went to go see the doctor initially. This was the day I entered the hospital. This was the day they released me. Um, so that uh, I, I figured at some point, if I live long enough as an autobiographical artist, I will, pro I will, I will uh, want to write about this experience. And so while the experience was fresh in my memory, um, I made quite a lot, quite a few notes. Um, so I had those and I, it was the kind of thing, this was a book that took, um, 
gosh, about, my math might be wrong, 15 years. I, I wrote it after the experience, roughly. And so I had these notes with me periodically. I'd pull them out and go through them and kind of cross things out and add, add new thoughts, um, new information or little things that I remembered that I hadn't remembered at first. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, um, the book, the way I envisioned it, what contained the, that story about my, my tumor and my surgery and things like that. But, um, clearly afterwards it, that wasn't the end of the story it was really just like the first act of this story that i was living through um these, this with these health issues and so you know when i left the hospital after my surgery they told me you know you're going to heal up we got the whole thing out it wasn't cancerous chances are this is never going to recur um you just need to go home heal up and get back on with your life and you'll be as good as new in a short time. And um, the truth was I never really recovered from that experience. I never really fully recovered from that surgery. Um, I, I still have problems related to that experience, you know, and at this point it's 23 years later or something. Um, Uh, so it was, uh, my point is it was a book that took a long time for me to figure out how to tell. And, um, it really wasn't until, uh, you know, several years ago when I finally sat down and finished the book in earnest that I, I kind of saw where it ended up. And that was when I finally had, uh, my OCD under control and, um, had a little bit of time and a little bit of perspective to be able to look back on the whole thing as one long arc and uh you know have the perspective and the and the distance to be able to tell the story um from beginning to what is you know the end um of the book so it, it took quite a bit um uh as far as redoing work, I, I generally, the way I work is that I, I write a lot. I, I keep notebooks full of stories um, and I write in kind of what you might call a script. Um, so it's kind of like, kind of like a movie script um, where I'll, I'll write down text. I'll break it up according to panels. I'll include uh, conversation and thought bubbles and sometimes I'll put little sketches in there if I'm trying to capture a character's uh, expression you know like uh, excitement or sadness or whatever um, but it's almost all text and I will um, write through a story like that and then leave it alone for a little bit and then come back to it and read through it and edit things as I move along move things around cut things out add things um, and then leave it alone for a little bit and then come back and go through it again. And maybe some of the stuff I cut, I put back in or I rearrange things further. Um, and I kind of go through this process of reading through <clears throat> the story and, uh, developing it a little bit at a time it, through on each run through until I get to a point where I feel like it's ready to start drawing. And at that point I'll start drawing in earnest. And like I mentioned earlier, um, at this point, having drawn comics for so long, I gen I kind of have an idea in my head about what uh, each panel is going to look like, um, how the page is going to be laid out, and it's just a matter of putting that down on paper. Now, once you do start putting something down on paper that you've only seen in your head previously, um, you need to be a little bit flexible, and sometimes the, the work on paper will take you in a direction that the work from your notebook didn't intend or didn't anticipate. And um, I always try to be open to those um, little bits where the story takes itself someplace that you hadn't imagined, because sometimes that brings a, can bring a, a freshness and it can bring a lot of, um, it can open, even as, you're, as the writer, it can open your eyes to new ideas and new concepts and the way things uh, are connected that you hadn't previously. So 
once I sit down and start drawing the comic, it's a, com it's a combination of following this script and then also kind of following my gut feelings or following my hand in a way where it's where it's leading me next. Um, uh, oftentimes you know, I draw very simply and I've drawn for a long time so like I said I kind of know what I want to do before I start to do it and I, I have this tendency that usually the first drawing I do is the drawing that um, makes its way to the final version. Um, sometimes you know I'll, I'll go in of course and, and uh, tweak things and kind of fine-tune things but then there's certain panels that I will draw and it'll just not work and I'll erase it and I'll redraw it and it doesn't work and I'll erase it. And sometimes I erase so much that I'm kind of taking away the, the top layer of the paper off and stuff because it's just being rubbed, rubbed out so, so much. And that tends to be the process for me is I either get it right the first time or if I, if I have to go back in and redraw something, it can take me um, quite a bit of time to get to get something right. Um, you know, the one thing I, w I say a lot about my work being so minimalist is that, um, you know, if a panel consists of four lines, you better, you have to make sure those, the four lines you draw are the right four lines because there's nowhere to hide. There, you, can't, you can't hide a bad composition behind a bunch of, yeah, uh, cross hatching or color or things like that. I, my work is so simple um, that it it does it, those four lines have have to be the right four lines. And sometimes it takes a little bit of work to 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 work that out satisfactorily. Uh, this is from Katie. I really enjoyed the visual representation of OCD and anxiety especially the positive and negative bubbles over the eyes and brain and the lack of blank space on page 205. Do you think that if this novel were to be written strictly with words and not as a graphic novel, it would have the same effective representation of mental wellness? And how do you think the popularity of the book in general would have been altered? Well, again, I, I, I don't know how effective it would have been as just a prose book. Um, I don't really, I don't think of my work in in those terms generally. Um, I mean, one thing that I will say is that <clears throat> I think comics are a way to sneak ideas sometimes into people's people's world. Um, by that, I mean, you know, if I dropped a 500 page book about some dude's experience with the healthcare system and uh, anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder and stuff like that. Uh, there's a certain intimidation factor. I'm sure there's people who would read it, um, who would be excited to read it. And I'm sure there'd be other people who would just be like, it looks too, like too much. You know, I mean, on the other hand, there are people who won't read a book because it's a graphic novel, because they have some certain prejudice against the, the idea that you know this is comics are are work for children or something or is that somehow some somehow it's dumbed down because there's images alongside the text um obviously i that's i don't believe that at all i think those people are missing out on a lot of stuff <clears throat> um so i i don't i don't know how it would um how effective or not it would i mean certainly people have written very effective prose um, writing about mental mental health, so um, you know people can do it. It's not, I don't think there's I don't think there's one approach that's better necessarily than another. I just think there's certain approaches that are are more suited to certain writers. Um, how do you think the popularity of the book in general would have been altered? Well, like, and, and this is what I was mentioning earlier is. Um, you know, uh, I write poetry as well, and um, poetry is a real hard sell for people. Most people don't want to read poetry. Um, if you walk up to somebody with a stack and like, hey, I just printed out this big stack of my poems, would you like to read them? I always say people, like the natural reaction to most people is to 
to say, uh, yeah, uh, and think of some place that they have to be real quick so they can get out of having to read your poetry. Now, on the other hand, I've taken poems that I've written and I've converted them into comics form. And it's almost, I, I describe it like, it's like uh, parents who um, blend cauliflower into their kids' pancakes or something. You know, it's like a sneak way of getting wholesome goodness into a person who just wants the, the sweet stuff that goes down easy. Um, so I don't know. Like I said, I'm sure there's some people who read, were interested to read the book because it's it's comics, and I'm sure there are people who refuse to read the book because it's comics. But that's not really my job to think about too much as as a writer. I just I just do what I do and hope for the best. So <laughs> I hope that's a good enough answer to that question. It's a, it's a tough one, but. Um, you know, I, I, I've learned to just do what I do and follow my own muse and accept where, where it leads me. This is a question from Jordan. There were several places in the book that had large blank spaces or just appeared to be more empty than others. I'm wondering what exactly you're trying to convey with the emptiness. Was it supposed to symbolize an emptiness or unknown that you felt, or was there another reason for it that I completely overlook? Um, some of that empty space um, I use in my comics to convey a situation that I've experienced where, this would be kind of tricky to put into words, but where um, the sense of self kind of breaks down. Like normally we, we have this, um, perspective that like I'm here I'm sitting here I'm in I'm lying in a hospital bed here comes this nurse they're putting an IV in my arm um, and there are points where um, that kind of perception for me can break down and it just becomes pure experience versus experience that you're trying to make sense of or you're trying to um, analyze or you're just perceiving in terms of self and other. And I think sometimes those open spots in my comics are um, a way for me to put on the page. I hate to say put on the page because usually it means I'm not doing anything. It's just blank, you know, but to, to convey that kind of sense where things break down and the, the, the typical way of perceiving the world that we have in our day to day life shifts a little and um, things change. It's the, I want to say that it goes beyond words, um, but obviously in comics you can go beyond words and just use imagery as well, but but it also goes beyond imagery. It goes beyond um, this kind of dichotomy of self that we typically feel in our day-to-day -day life, of self and other, of, of I'm here, you're there, somebody else is over there and there's this space between us and we're different beings having different experiences um all that stuff is very true but i think there's a way of 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 perceiving the world that um breaks down those kind of barriers that we typically feel between ourself and others or our, our self and things even and uh yeah, I said this is going to be hard to describe, but I, I think, you know, that's what I'm trying to perceive. I know there there's moments also in the book where um, the pain that I'm, the physical pain I'm experiencing is, is so um, intense, so brutal that it, it, I think, I don't know if I was in shock, 
you know, maybe that's what it was in a physical sense, but where that breaks down as well. The, the pain is so intense that it's almost like having an out-of-body experience or something, like your consciousness is, 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 um, I, I can't explain it, but I think that sometimes if I remember right in the book, I use the blank spaces as well to convey that kind of experience of just kind of, and, and maybe it is just like, it's, it's such an intense experience. It's so, uh, excruciating that that conscious thinking analyzing mind shuts off for a little while so i hope that's a okay answer to your question this is from aria mental illness can be a topic that is tough to talk about because it's something that's very personal and sharing your own experiences can make you feel vulnerable. Did you find that using cartoon style and graphic novel format for the story made it easier to talk about these topics and to share your experiences? Well, I will say this, um, like I, I've mentioned a few times that the primary, um, my, my primary means of getting my work into the world is this self-published um, comic called King Cat, or what you would call a zine. Mine, mine is a zine that happens to be comics, but there are people publish zines in all kinds of formats and uh, you know some of them are prose, some of them are art, um, some are drawing, some are poetry, whatever. But a zine is basically just like a, a self-published, uh, very personal uh, publication that people make and usually share or you know sell them through the, through the mail or at book festivals and things like that. Um, and I can tell you that uh, when I was very young, like grammar school age up into high school, I was very, very um, self-conscious. I was very pathologically shy, I would say. Um, I felt very uncomfortable in social situations. I, I, I had a, a, a lack of self-esteem. Um, and at the same time, I was a very creative person that had these ideas in my head that I wanted to share with people. And um, luckily for me, I found this this way of of making little magazines. So I I would write out these stories or poems or or uh, comics and. Uh, give them to my dad and he would take them to his office and photocopy them. And then I could hand them out to people and um, share them that way. And so I think that it, um, having that format gave me a little bit of a release, relief valve for that anxiety and, and self-consciousness that I felt. So whereas if I tried to talk to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, face to face in a conversational way, I'd feel very uncomfortable. Um, I'd worry about what I was saying, how I was saying it, what the person was, how they were responding to what I was saying, um, typically in a negative way. I mean, personally, I would, I would, I would think, oh, why did I say that? I sound so stupid. This person must think I'm an idiot, stuff like that. And by photocopying this stuff, it gave a little bit of a buffer, I think, between me and the world where I was able to share it and um, connect with people that way. And so, um, you know, um, that led me ultimately to where I was when I was making this book. And so, um, you know, I, I, th I think I'm a lot better nowadays in terms of my uh, social aptitude and my ability to carry on conversations with people and things like that without without my brain instantly going to all these horrible places but um you know i still i still have that part of me that this is the way i feel comfortable expressing myself this is the way i feel comfortable communicating um you know one thing about uh comics and zine well zines in particular is that, and this was something that I was very interested in when I say that I wanted to communicate with people, is that I did not want to just, you know, come down from the mountain and hand out my zine and say, here's my latest proclamations about life and the world and stuff, you know, you're welcome. 
but I wanted to share this stuff with people in a two-way street kind of thing. And so in the zine world, um, like I mentioned, there's there's all these people who are involved in this and, and you know, things are different now with the internet. When I started out, there was no internet. Things were shared through the mail, for instance. Um, and, uh, you know, so I would send out an issue of King Cat to some people and then they would write back to me and they'd tell me what they, their their reaction to this new issue or, in a lot of cases, they had their own zine and they would send, you know, they'd write back to me and tell me about their reactions to New King Cat. And they say, here's mine, you know, here's my new comic or my new zine. And I would write back to them. And you developed relationships with people long distance that way um, through this creative act. And so, um, you know, for me personally, the way I do comics with, with King Cat and with the zine, um, I'm able to have a much uh, more direct relationship with my readers than I would um, otherwise. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure Stephen King gets plenty of fan mail or whatever. You know, people telling him, you know, that they liked his latest book or whatever. So it's not like it's something that's exclusive to the Zine world. But um, you know, the people who have read my comics for a long time, I've been doing it now for uh, 31 years. Um, doing King Cat for 31 years, we've grown up together. You know, some of these people were 14 year old kids when they started reading King Cat. Now they're in their mid forties. You know what I mean? So um, it's been a way for me to address that kind of uh, alienation I felt from people in a, in a, in a one-on-one -on -one sense when I was younger. Um, so I, it's probably a real roundabout way of answering your question, but, um, you know, so yeah, I think cartoon style and graphic novel format, it, uh, it's the way that I found to communicate most effectively with people. Um, I do think that there's something about comics that is, can be a little more universal that allows the reader to maybe put themselves into a situation um, you know, great, great prose and fiction and stuff does that as well. So it's, again, it's not something exclusive, but uh, the people that react to comics react to it in that way. And, you know, I'm grateful they're out there. Okay, this one's from Bobby. Would you consider your willpower or will to defeat your ailments to be at the core of why you never gave up? If so, why do you think your willpower was so great? Where did your strong desire to not give up and defeat your ailments originate from? Um, I don't know that I would, I don't know that I would say that, I'm, I'm sure there were plenty of times where I just wished that this stuff would disappear or that somehow I could finally, you know, like, as you say, defeat your my ailments and put them behind me. Um, but I think that um, possibly even more than that, my goal was to learn to come to terms with them, you know, like a certain uh, feeling of if, you know, if this is the way my life is going to be, then how do I adapt to that? How do I make the most of it? How do I um, respond to this situation in a way that feels okay to me. Um, as far as never giving up, I, I don't, I mean, I just kept living my life, you know, so I'd wake up every morning and um, see where I was at. Um, I, 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 I like I'm I'm speaking extemporaneously now off the top of my head, so I could come to regret this or disagree with it in an hour or a week or a month or a year. But um, you know, I I came out of a punk rock background, and um, punk means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But to me, 
one of the great things that I got from punk was the ability, or, I, or even I guess you could say the desire to have the ability to see things for what they are. So uh, instead of layering all this extra junk on top of experience, um, to be able to kind of see it directly for what it is. Um, which means not sugarcoating the terrible things and not making a big deal out of the easy things, but just kind of accepting things, not in an apathetic way, but a accepting the reality of any given situation. Um, and so I think I had certain tools at my disposal when all this stuff was happening to approach things that way. Um, you know, for instance, when my ears got bad, I kind of talk about this in a roundabout way, but I've, I've had this disorder called hypertusis since 95, so a couple of years before the stuff in the hospital suite took place. It starts out, I talk about my ears and how I'm trying to improve my hearing. So hypertusis is a disease or a syndrome where everyday sounds um, become very painful and there's a lot of um, extreme pain and pressure and uh, people have, a lot of people have different symptoms when they have hyperacusis. But um, basically everyday sounds for me became excruciatingly painful. Uh, and the pain would last anywhere from, you know, 24 hours to a month or so. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd played in bands and stuff since the time I was a teenager. And uh, when I developed hyperacusis, I didn't really know what was happening. And I, I tried to continue playing in bands, um, but it clearly was the worst thing that I could do to my ears. And, um, you know, I remember making the kind of difficult decision that you know, I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was running my distro. I was drawing King Cat. I was playing in bands. I had a little record label and stuff. And I, and I thought, you know, I can't, I can't really play in a rock band anymore. And uh, I guess, you know, what can I do that uh, will let me withdraw a little bit from the noise of the world and still allow me this creative outlet? And luckily, I, I had King Cat, and so. You know, this was 95. That's, I've been drawing King Cat at that point for six years, six and a half years. And, and so I, that was when I kind of decided, well, let's focus on this one thing instead of spreading myself out all among all these other creative um, paths. And that's another example I think of just, you know, did I want to stop playing in a band? Not really. I love playing music. Um, but the reality was I, I couldn't do it anymore and um, could be for a lot of different reasons. I still don't know how or why I developed hyperacusis, but um, I just tried to come up with a new way to respond and a new way to engage with things um, that would allow me to keep going. And, and that's what I always did throughout, you know, this, this illness and this mental illness. I have a, uh, a personal motto that is called root hog or die. And it was an old pioneer phrase <clears throat> um, that basically meant, you know, they, they would let the hogs go wild in the woods and dig up their own food instead of feeding them because everything was so, they were it was so frugal and they didn't have a lot of resources. And so the phrase root hog or die kind of became a pioneer expression of self uh, self-sustenance, self, um, taking care of oneself, taking responsibility for oneself and one's life. And, uh, when I heard that when I was a teenager and it, it stuck with me ever since. And so I think that's probably part of why I never gave up either. It's just this root hog or die mentality I have of just life changes all the time. And oftentimes it changes in ways, uh, we don't like but you just have to keep going with those changes and, and keep trying to do your best no matter what.
Uh, Nicole here, she writes, do you think it was easier to describe your journey through words or drawings? Um, again, I think I probably answered this a little bit earlier with that previous question. Um, um, I don't know that either one is easier or more difficult. I just think that, um, you know, like I said, sometimes uh, my stuff takes the form of traditional comments, comics. Sometimes it takes the form of straightforward prose on a page um, or poetry or things like that. And what I'm always trying to find in, in my work is just to find what feels the most natural way of expressing any given idea or um, and, uh, you know, sometimes I'll work on a comic and it doesn't really go anywhere or it's very, um, it's like I'm, I'm being dragged through this comic instead of it being this natural kind of flow. You know, sometimes those will end up being, you know, I'll just rewrite, I'll rewrite them as just a straight prose piece. Um, or as like an illustrated text piece, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put some drawings in it, but it's more of a, they're more of for illustrative purposes than a, a comic where the words and pictures are more integrated. Um, so I can't say that any one of these is easier or tougher than the others, only that um, sometimes one approach seems right and one approach uh, doesn't. And sometimes it's a matter of trial and error to figure out which one works. Um, okay, this is from Connor. Throughout true anxiety, I noticed your experience with OCD and anxiety seem to have moments where things are going well, followed by different triggers again. Did you find that describing the up and down nature of OCD and anxiety was easiest through a graphic novel? Um, you know, it, what can I add to that besides the, the previous questions? You know, I, I I do think that there are certain advantages to comics uh, over over um, straight prose in certain in instances and in, in certain writers' hands, um, because there are times where you can let the the text the words fall away a little bit and emphasize the drawings and so the drawings can <clears throat> uh, express emotions or reactions or movement or all kinds of things that in a more efficient way sometimes than words and so as a cartoonist you have uh, this huge um, toolbox at your disposal for how you want to express any given moment in your work. And um, uh, so, you know, I can do a drawing, I can, I can write about the experience of having this terrible, brutal anxiety that's you know, zapping my body, or I can do a drawing of, you know, ah, with all these lines coming off my head and lightning bolts zapping my brain and stuff like that. And, um, you know, pictures um, can be more direct in some ways uh, than, than words, because they go, they go beyond words a little bit you know, to maybe some, a little bit more primal experience or something like that. Um, so, you know, that's one of the nice things about being a cartoonist is you have uh, a whole bunch of, of tools at your disposal. And, uh, you know, as you go through your time making comics and get more experience, you kind of learn intuitively what works in a given situation. And uh, sometimes I think that can be more effective. I mean, at least it is for me. You know, maybe I'm not skilled enough of a prose writer to be able to uh, to put some of that stuff into pure words. But you know, I don't think about that. I just accept the fact that I'm I'm on this planet as a cartoonist, and this is what I do, and this is how I do it. So, okay, here's one from John. There's just a couple more. 
Uh, when you create a graphic novel, you're writing to a different audience compared to a traditional novel. Does this style of writing give you a different connection to the reader? Um, again, I'm not a prose writer, so I, you know, I don't know what the difference, the different audience would be. I would imagine that it is somewhat of a different audience because I, like I, I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, I think there are a lot of people who really love reading, who really love books and who have a kind of built-in negative view of comics and it's you know unfortunately in our culture i think that we we can become predisposed to that kind of thing where it's just like oh picture books those are for kids like a uh you know a grown adult wouldn't be caught reading something with pictures you know obviously that's changing a lot but there's still a certain stigma against comics in in the eyes of a lot of people. Um, you know, one thing I will say about comics is it's it's a, it's huge now. You know, you go to one of these comics conventions like SPX in Washington, D.C. that they have every fall, and it's this massive affair now. with Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of artists and writers, cartoonists, um, tabling, doing presentations about their work, panel discussions, um, it's this massive undertaking. Um, you know, I've been doing comics and this kind of comics, what you might call alternative comics or art comics. I've been doing it for long enough that I can remember when I could count the number of people making these kind of comics on maybe two hands to be to be honest about it. You know, maybe there were seven or eight people around the country that were doing, um, you know, small press, uh, more personal, more idiosyncratic comics um, than the standard, you know, superhero or genre stuff that is more what people typically think of when they think of comics. So, I mean, one thing I will say about comics that I've also been uh, appreciative of is that um, the world of comics is still, I feel, as large as it is now, it's still small enough that if you are a cartoonist with some skill and something original to say and a little uh, and, and willing to have a little bit of perseverance um the world of comics is still one where the good stuff um uh becomes discovered the good the good stuff um the well done stuff the original work um kind of rises to find the audience, the audience um, can find it. Um, there's, you know, in the world of prose books and stuff, there's so many publishers, so many writers that I can't imagine how hard it would be to make a name for yourself in that world. You know, and like the world of music is the same. I, I have friends who are uh, just, I mean, truly genius musicians and songwriters and things, and they've struggled their whole life just to get their foot in some kind of door, <laughs> you know, and um, it has nothing to do with the quality of their work. It, um, you know, some people who are extremely talented do miraculously find, find, find their audiences and stuff in those other worlds, but there's an awful lot of people who are very talented and who deserve an audience and who have something um, really um, special to say that and it's in these other worlds it can it can be um a truly uphill battle and um so i'm grateful that i got involved in comics especially i got involved in comics at a time where um it was easier to put work out there and have people notice it because there it, it wasn't such a cacophony of people screaming for attention if that makes any sense um so there, you know, I was able to create an audience and the fact that I've done this consistently for over 30 years, you know, that helps too. Every, you know, I've never been a person who was very um, ambitious or pushy about my work. I, 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 I'm not the kind of person who's gonna shove it in your face and make sure you read it. Um, I, I put it out in the world and if you find it, um, 
that's great. And if you like it and appreciate it, that's wonderful. But um, I've always just kind of let things take their natural course. And um, for me, at least in comics, uh, that that world has, has allowed that to happen. And does this style of writing give you a different connection to the reader? I I would say, you know, maybe not, not you know, not a hundred percent necessarily in the case of these book format things like map uh, or I'm sorry, um, the hospital suite. Uh, but because of what I've done with King Cat in the background this whole time, um, I've been able to develop a little bit of a close closer relationship, I think, with my readership than many many authors have. Okay, the last question is from Alex. How strongly have your OCD and anxiety symptoms affected you during the writing process? How has it changed throughout your career? Um, so, you know, I think in the hospital suite, there's a couple scenes in there that I put in there to try to express um, how hard it was at times to, to um, continue doing my work. Uh, there's a cat here floating through the air with um with this uh m massive brutal anxiety going on in the background all the time and sometimes it was almost impossible and there were many many cases where i had a story that i wanted to make a comic that i wanted to make and i had to end up um Compromise sounds like a bad word, and you know I probably would have preferred to have just been able to follow my instincts with them. But where, where I was working on a story and I hit some kind of irrational wall um, with my OCD, and um, I I had to find a way to still express myself in a way that felt right, but kind of um given a little bit to this anxiety that I had so I had to find ways to work around that anxiety to say what I wanted to say in a way that this stupid irrational anxiety would allow me to and a lot of times that was extremely frustrating you know like I said I I, I started out in the punk rock world and my early comics are very very different than the kind of stuff you read in in um, the hospital suite. They were much more raw, they were spontaneous, they were crude, um, they were obnoxious in a lot of ways. And I took a lot of delight in just throwing down on the page anything that I wanted to throw down on the page without worrying about it or second guessing it. And what I found in the OCD years was I was second guessing my second guesses, you know, I was, uh, it, it just cripples your, your confidence because um, I always say OCD is a disease of doubt. It, it throws doubt into every every decision that you make or every impulse you have. You you question it, and then when you question that impulse, you question why you're questioning the the, the impulse, and and it just is this endless um, kind of onion of layers of doubt and insecurity and fear. And so it was very difficult at times to write, um, certainly the way that I had it in the past. Um, when I look, strangely, when I look back at the OCD years now, like the comics that I drew in the Map of My Heart collection, um, there's a certain refinement and purity is also a bad word because that makes it sound like it's a, it's a, there's purity and then there's impure and somehow they were impure before, but there's a certain kind of purity of focus that I had at that time because I was so hyper vigilant about everything. I, I, I would obsess over every word that I put on the page. I would obsess over every line. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm glad that I had OCD, but, um, you know, I think, it, you know, one of the things they'll say about OCD is that everybody has a little bit of obsessive compulsiveness in them. And in some ways, that's probably what drives us to do things better. You know, if if you didn't have that desire to improve yourself, you'd always be satisfied with your, your first effort, no matter how tossed off it was. 
um, the question is when does that when does that obsessive compulsive kind of nature of ours uh, lose you you lose the balance with it and it and it takes over and it it starts hurting you rather than helping you. So in a funny way, I look back at those those comics, um, and I can kind of appreciate um, what the OCD put me through, and I can see it in the work itself. And after my OCD got better, after I got back on medication and it lifted. Um, I went through a kind of multi-year period where I was still, you know, I was still doing my comics and putting them out, but I feel like I was relearning. My brain was relearning how to make comics without this kind of oppressive OCD voice in my head all the time running things. And I, in a way, I feel like my comics immediately post OCD period got a little bit sloppy again because i was just kind of happy to just put the ink down on paper and just say screw it and and that's good enough and i don't want to you know kill myself over this stuff anymore and um i think what i've relearned in the past decade or, or been trying to relearn is to find a balance between the, like the spontaneity of my early work and the the freedom of my early work and the kind of precision maybe or clarity that my work um, developed during my OCD years and trying to find a way to put the best of those two mental <laughs> approaches together in my work at this point. And I, I, you know, it's been 10 years or so and I feel just in the last couple of years that maybe I finally started to uh, to re, re to achieve that new kind of balance where I'm able to uh, take elements from both those approaches and and kind of unify them in my work. Okay, so those are all the questions. I hope that that's uh, helpful to you. Um, I'm I uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you taking you the the questions that you asked. They were all very good questions and. Um, you know, I'm very approachable. You know, it's it's very easy to find my email address or find me on social media or whatever. So if you have any other questions or you have had questions or things you wanted to talk about more one on one, I'm always open to talk to people. Um, and I'd be happy to hear anything else that you you wanted to bring up. But in any case, thank you, Colin, and thank you, everybody in the class and uh, stay safe and be well. Thank you.